Hello, Lucy from North London in the UK here. Congratulations on reaching your 300th podcast episode. I think I've practically listened to them all, (laughs) mainly while walking my dog in the afternoons. I've been listening for years and am now a top music pro member. I'm very grateful for your kind, enthusiastic, humble, but not cringeworthy, very important, presentation style, and have learned a lot about how to teach creatively. Um, The core teaching in particular has meant that those students who don't want to do grades, play traditional classical music, find it hard to read music, don't want to practice, are still teachable with core progressions within their chosen pop music. Also, as an aside, I was at a teacher's convention at a music school where I teach the other day, and we were tasked with improvising with a fellow teacher. In the past, this might have been a problem for me, but not now. I thought of a core progression, and away we went. Cheers, Tim and team. You're listening to the Integrated Music Teaching Podcast from Top Music. Tune in weekly as we interview music teachers and experts from around the world to explore creative activities and ideas that build learning connections in students. Our integrated music teaching approach will deepen your students' understanding of musical concepts, engage them in critical thinking, improve their reading and performance, foster their curiosity, and prepare them for a lifetime of music making. Tim Topham here and welcome to the Integrated Music Teaching Podcast. And no, you're not mistaken, this is the same podcast that you have always been listening to and we have recently updated the imagery and changed the name and I'll be talking about that in today's episode. The other reason this is a special episode is this is episode number 300. I actually can't believe we got here seven years after I started way back in February 2015 over seven years, and I'm very excited to be playing throughout today's episode the voicemails that a number of our listeners have left very kindly sharing what the podcast has meant to them over the last seven years or so. So, what are we going to talk about today? Well, we're going to have a quick look back on where the podcast came from, got a couple of fun things to share for you. And today's focus, we're going to be talking about what integrated music teaching actually is and why I changed the name of the podcast. And we've got two very exciting announcements in regard to Integrated Music Teaching or IMT. Firstly, that I'm hosting the Integrate Your Teaching Challenge coming up in November. This is going to be a free three-day challenge jam-packed with ideas and activities all based around the integrated music teaching process, which I'm going to be telling you a little bit about today. We'll set up a pop-up Facebook group. We'll give you some homework to do each night. And we're going to be helping you implement this into your teaching and experience exactly how it works. We're also going to be sharing videos by other teachers around the world of how they integrate music into their lessons on a variety of instruments, including people like Mike Grande, Jenna Williamson, Nicola Canton, Ingrid Martin, and many more. So, if you'd like to register for the challenge, you can do that right now at topmusic.co slash challenge. And final announcement is that we are also going to be announcing and talking about our Certificate of Integrated Music Teaching, our brand new certification course at Top Music. We've been working on it for ages and I can't wait to bring it to you. I'll talk about that a little bit later as well. But first, let's go back and have a bit of a chat about the first episode. Now, the first episode was in February 2015 and that was with Daniel McFarlane, who's actually coming back on the show after 300 episodes really soon. And it was a great episode. He was at the piano and we were talking all about creative uh, compositional strategies. And he gave away this one page cheat sheet, which you can still get for free. I still use it. It's such a great little resource for quick compositional ideas for students. It's a one page. You can download it at topmusic.co slash episode one. But some of you may not know that the first episode, the reason I actually started the podcast was after I was invited to interview a presenter who was coming to Australia for a workshop on the Taubman technique. And I was invited to interview this person because I did have a following on my blog and um, they wanted some promotion for the workshop. And I'm so glad that they did. Now, you can actually watch the YouTube video of this. It's awful, um, (laughs) as is so much of the first time you ever do anything. The audio is awful. You can, the video is terrible. It looks like I did it on like a 1920s iPad or something. Um, But you can go and watch it. Uh, We'll put a link in the show notes if you do want to have a bit of a laugh. But the content was great. And after the interview, 
the person I was interviewing said, Tim, you are a really natural interviewer. You should do more of this, all words to that effect. And also the person who was hosting the workshop said the same thing. And it really got me thinking because I have always enjoyed talking to people and finding out more about what they do and sharing that with other people and building networks and connecting people. That's my thing. I really love doing it. And so it really made sense to take their advice and go, well, maybe I should do a podcast. At the time, I was listening to lots of other people's podcasts, mainly in the marketing and business space as I was um, building my own business. Uh, But there wasn't really much in the way of music teaching podcasts back then. I was certainly one of the first. And uh, you now look around and I'm only too proud to know that there's probably, I don't even know, 20, I'd guess, piano teaching related podcasts. And then at least 20 or 30 more that include all the other instruments and general music and things like that. I think it's super cool. Hey, Tim, just want to congratulate you on your 300th podcast and to say a huge thanks for all you do for the piano community as you continue to inspire us to become better teachers. Wishing you all the best and here's to the 400th. Hi, Tim. This is Amber Harnish here from Canberra. I just wanted to say congratulations on 300 episodes of your podcast. What an incredible achievement. It is just a constant source of inspiration and encouragement for piano teachers like me. And um, I was honoured to have been on one of those podcasts a number of years ago. So, yes, congratulations again. Have a lot of fun with your recording and we can't wait to hear it. All the best. Bye. Now, the name has also changed a few times, not just for this episode, but who can remember what it was first called? I'll give those of our long-term listeners a quick chance to think about it. It was actually called Tim Topham TV because it was a video podcast. So, originally, I recorded and shared all the videos and a lot of them, I think, are still up on YouTube. We have all of them are in the membership too, if anyone wants to go back and have a look at some of those early ones. So, for example, that first episode with Daniel McFarlane, You can go and watch the interview with him at the piano if you would like to. So, it's there somewhere in the membership or maybe it's on YouTube. I can't even remember, but Tim Topham TV was definitely how it started. And then, what did it become next? There's another one and there's another one and then there's the current one. So, there's another two to go through. So, the next one, I called it the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast, which really made it clear that it did what it said on the tin. That was exactly what we were talking about at the time. And then when I rebranded at the start of 2020, around the time of the launch of Piano Pivot Live, I renamed it and rebranded it the current most recent name, which is the Topcast. And so, that was the most recent previous one and now, of course, the Integrated Music Teaching Podcast. And I wonder if anyone can remember the music that I originally had, the intro music from the first show. I thought... Let's let's actually play it because it's kind of funny to listen to. Here it is. Here's the Tim Topham TV, I think, or was it the Creative Potential Podcast? It's been so long ago. Here's the intro music. I'd love to know if any of you remember this one. Well, I hope that brought back some fun memories of listening to the podcast way back. That was actually from episode 85, that particular take, but I used that for more than 100 episodes, I think, probably even more than that. Anyway, today's new name, the Integrated Music Teaching Podcast, Um, and we've changed the name in order to represent our focus on this approach uh, going forward. We're still going to have a mix of guests and interviews and different styles and solo shows. But we're also going to feature lots of integrated music teaching content as well. So, what is this all about? Well, let's dig into it. Hi, Tim. This is Christina. And I live in Los Angeles. And yes, it's the city of cars. So, I'm in my car driving a lot, which is why I love listening to the top cast. And I now have post-its cluttering my car because there are so many wonderful ideas that I'll be scribbling safely in traffic 
great ideas or more to look up or things to bookmark. And then also I can get a great idea. I have gotten lesson that day because of something I've been inspired by on TopCast. And then my favorite episode was probably, oh, there's so many favorite, but the Benjamin Zander one, I literally had to pull over into a grocery store parking lot because I was crying. I was so moved. So thank you for making LA traffic almost a treat. Hey, Tim, my name is Amy and I am calling from the state of Utah in the United States. I have loved listening to your podcast over the past several years. It's absolutely fantastic. Uh, I've been teaching piano lessons for 26 years, and I always thought of my teaching as this like incredibly fun hobby, which I deeply love. But your podcast really helped me to see that my teaching was also a real and important profession and career, and I really appreciate that. I have enjoyed all the hundreds of ideas, the resources, the valuable tools that I've learned from your podcast. Um, You just have such a wealth of information on there. I also really appreciate you opening up the marketplace for teachers and musicians to share and sell their products. I am a composer and I've written many piano solos, but I had no place to publish or sell my music. And the marketplace has really given me a unique opportunity to self-publish and put my music out there. So thank you. Thank you, Tim. Congratulations on your 300th episode. I look forward to listening, learning, and enjoying from your podcast for many more years to come. About 10 years ago, I realized that there was something very different about my music teaching compared to other teachers. It became obvious when I'd take makeup lessons, masterclasses, and mock exams with other teachers' students, and I'd ask the students seemingly simple questions like, what's the key of the piece you're playing? Or, what does Andante tell you about how to play this piece? Or, tell me about the time signature. Or, what would you call this musical pattern or shape or phrase? And I'd get totally blank looks. I was surprised because these would seem to be fairly fundamental areas of musical knowledge that students should understand if they want to play to even a moderate standard. In fact, I'm not even sure how it's possible to teach music or have students learn music without understanding or at least referencing these elements. And I also couldn't understand how a student could possibly have a solid musical understanding of a piece of music without knowing a little bit about its construction, things like its harmonic and rhythmic basis, the patterns it's built on, the modulations, the title, perhaps a little bit of history about the composer, and so forth. In addition, I'd listen to students who couldn't tell that sometimes they were adding an extra beat to their waltz, so the 3-4 had become 4-4, four, four, and they were kind of blithely playing along, or whose swing rhythm was kind of lopsided, or who couldn't tell they were adding extra beats or rhythmic patterns in the wrong place or missing accidentals even in pieces. They weren't really listening to what they were doing and they certainly didn't have a clear sense of connections between all the different parts of the pieces they were playing. Over time, I've come to realize that the reason for this lack of understanding in students was because of three key factors associated with a traditional music lesson. Number one, the linear disconnected approach to teaching repertoire theory and technique all in separate buckets. Number two, a focus on the tip of the iceberg activities, which I call and talk about as reading, interpretation and performance, and a missed opportunity to use creative activities to teach these fundamental concepts. Unfortunately, the traditional approach to teaching music often follows a very linear path and has done so for 150 or more years. So what do I mean by linear? Well, in many lessons, the student enters, plays some scales, then moves on to piece number one, followed by piece number two, and finally piece number three. Perhaps there'll be a little time for improv or a pop song before the student departs with their practice orders. And indeed, for many teachers, linear can also describe their overall approach to curriculum planning, particularly in exam cultures where the goal simply seems to be to zip through as many grades as possible year after year. For some exam students, what this linear approach means is that the only time any of the underlying musical knowledge is explored is in the two-week lead-up to an exam where teachers suddenly realise they haven't covered any of this general knowledge content and attempt to cram as much of this information into the student as possible. Unfortunately, this misses the entire point as learning about these musical elements and connecting them to the written repertoire during the learning process can have a profoundly positive impact on learning outcomes. I learned this 
so strongly during my own performance diploma preparation work where I went deep into the background and history to all these composers, what they were doing, what their lives were like, what was happening in music at the time, how was the music put together, what was different, what was similar, all of these aspects. But for some teachers, it's a little bit uncertain about how do you teach these elements during lessons. Well, by no means perfect, my own students would always be able to answer questions such as the one I posed earlier because I was constantly discussing and connecting these musical elements in lessons. For example, what's the key of this piece, I would ask. How do you know? If it's a minor piece, why are there accidentals on some of the seventh notes? We can talk about raised sevenths and some of the traditions around the harmonic minor scale. Other questions, why are the main chords, sorry, what are the main chords in the progression? Can you play them? What's the cadence at the end? What key does it modulate to? How's that related to the original key? Where are these keys on the circle of fifths and how are they interrelated? What does the title tell us about the piece? What musical era is the piece from? What does that tell us about how to interpret this phrase or this style of playing? What are some common elements in music from this era? Things like Alberti bass. Do you remember when we used this pattern in the last piece? What was similar, different? What does the metronome marking mean? How's that related to the key signature? Some of the above questions could be asked before they even started a piece, assuming that they've been learning for a few years. For example, any piano student, in my opinion, should be able to predict the basic chords or harmony likely to be found in a piece of music in a given key before they even look at the music. And a side note, this is the basis for fluent sight reading. So a great question to pose before a student starts reading a new piece is, what chords do you expect to find outlined in the left hand? And then while looking at the music, Were you right? Well, let's go through the harmony together and unpack it. Hello, this is Leela Viss, longtime friend and fan of Tim, his podcast, and his top music community. I'm pleased to support his groundbreaking efforts. Key Ideas is my podcast, and when you get finished with Tim's latest episode, I invite you to tune into Key Ideas. It's filled with illuminating interviews and transparent reflections. Besides podcasting, I enjoy encouraging musicians to get creative beyond the page and jumpstart their composing skills. Are you interested in nurturing budding composers too, but aren't sure where to begin? If so, it's time to sign up for my 8 plus 8 Composium. It's a four-week online course and limited to eight teachers. Within just a few short weeks, You'll design your own composition eight bars at a time and take away tons of strategies to help your students do the same. Head to leelavis.com, use discount coupon code TOP10 and save on registration. I look forward to meeting you and your creativity. Teachers can also make connections outside of music. For example, For a student who only practices by playing a piece through from start to finish, reference can be made to sports practice, if they're sportsmen or women, when students really get to play a full game of tennis, soccer, basketball, and instead will do drills and running and push-ups and whatever during their training. Music is like the drills. Playing the piece from start to finish is like playing a full game. Sometimes this analogy is alone enough to help students understand the importance of breaking up their practice and doing those drills. Another connection might be for students who consistently rush their playing and to play too fast. And teachers in this circumstance can talk about the Formula One car racing concept I learned of walking the track. And I've got a full blog over about that at Top Music. You can check it out in the show notes. There are many more connections that can be made as you get to know your students and their interests. You just have to find them. In addition, we can also go further than just asking questions and making references. At Top Music, we've already spent the best part of a decade helping teachers to think outside the box and be more creative in their lessons. Through activities like the 12-bar blues, four-chord composing, learning to accompany, playing and creating lead sheets, improvising, playing by ear, and playing pop music from chords, students will enjoy much more varied musical experiences and be able to showcase their own creations to the world. And these are what I call the bottom of the iceberg activities. And if you'd like to see a picture of the iceberg imagery in action, head over to the show notes for today's episode at topmusic.co slash episode 300. We also at Top Music know how hard many classically trained teachers have had to work in order to confidently lead students through some of these bottom of the iceberg activities, given that they were not exposed to them as students themselves. 
Adding creative elements to music lessons adds enormous value and enjoyment for students. However, we can go a step further. By integrating these creative and theoretical elements with the repertoire and scales students are already learning, we can immerse students in a much deeper and more meaningful learning experience and strengthen their understanding of all the interconnected parts. And I found a reference I wanted to uh, quote, I should say, from Dr. Martha Baker-Jordan from her book, Practical Piano Pedagogy. It's a 2003 book, massive, big, fat, huge, thick book. (laughs) Some of you may have it on your shelf. And I found this, which I thought was fantastic. She said, of what value would it be to teach the definitions of dynamic markings without having students observe such markings in their current repertoire? Or to have students learn complicated rhythmic patterns but never actually play them? All elements of music instruction must be consistently integrated so that students perceive all segments of music study as an integrated whole whose parts are all interrelated. And this, teaching a student to compose, integrates and complements the skills needed to become a proficient reader in ways that many other parts of teaching cannot. I absolutely loved reading that from a noted pedagogue in this massive book. So, for example, here are some activities that strengthen connections between repertoire, theory, harmony, technical work, etc. We could say to a student, let's improvise in this style using the left hand of the piece you're learning and create a brand new melody in the right hand using the scale of the key of the piece. For some of you who have followed me for a while, you'll know I call that repertoire remixing. What if we transpose this piece or melodic idea up or down into a new key? Or... What if we turned major into minor? How would we do that? What notes in the melody and harmony would need to change? And we could ask, how would we make a lead sheet out of this? Or what if we change the left-hand pattern to a new style? Could we turn the tango into a Mozart-style piece? Could we turn a boogie into a rock piece? And we could ask, could you compose a new melody based on this right-hand melodic pattern? And things like, could we improvise over the melodic minor scale of this piece? And so forth. What I've come to realize, and this is crucial, is that my teaching and the approach of teachers who lay the strongest foundations for students is not just creative, it's inherently interconnected or integrated, as I like to call it. Hi, this is Alicia Glaser from Grand Island, Nebraska in the United States. I have been profoundly impacted by what I've learned from Tim Topham, his resources, podcasts, and anything I have read on his website from any presenters and guest teachers. I have taught public school K-3 music for about 14 years. Last year, I actually quit my public school teaching job and strictly have been teaching in my own studio, the Glaser Music Studio here in Grand Island. I went from the setting of teaching one-on-one, about 15 students at my max, to teaching group lessons about six years ago. I have grown my studio to over 100 students, and I absolutely love the group setting. I love how in group lessons, it combines all the musicians' efforts. Um, They're creating together. They're listening together. They're developing together at a faster rate. They are more calm, yet more confident. They are refining their abilities and they're collaborating. They work more as a team and they honestly are more motivated in this group setting and are growing at a faster rate. And I am retaining students so much more. You have profoundly inspired me. Hey, Tim, congrats on 300 episodes. I absolutely love the top cast. This is Kelly. And finding my tribe of other creative piano teachers and all of the amazing ideas and support and validation of what I love to do has been amazing. So if I had to pick favorite episodes, it might be Ben Zander's episode because that one was so inspiring. But I really just love all of them. So thanks for doing what you're doing. Keep it up and congrats on 300. So after a decade's teaching and research work, presentations, workshops, webinars, and speaking to thousands of teachers, I've codified the approach to make music lessons a much more cohesive, connected, and immersive experience. 
It combines over 20 years of my experience teaching in both classrooms and instrumental studios in countries like Australia, the United Kingdom, New Zealand, and America in subjects including physical education, outdoor education, maths, health, information technology, and music. I've taught all of them. And it blends what I've learned from years of personal research and external study in music, business, education, and performance. It's called Integrated Music Teaching, and it's a teaching approach that any teacher can adopt to suit their teaching style while keeping the repertoire they love as the core component. You don't need to completely change everything you do. You don't need to change all your music. You don't even need a new method book series. This approach integrates with the teaching you're already doing and enhances it big time. Indeed, some of you may already be doing this in your teaching right now and perhaps using our framework, lesson plans and integrated activities will take it even further. Integrated music teaching is based on a set of three foundational pillars, student-first teaching, multimodal assessment and continuous curiosity. And we deliver it through a a three-step teaching process that will initially be teacher-led, but eventually we hope our students will start taking the lead. And the three steps are to analyze the repertoire, to find the connections, and to plan the integration activities. We're going to go into more detail of these pillars and steps in our next article and podcast. We'll also share videos showing how these connections actually look in practice. Now, before I wrap things up, some of you may be thinking, well, I don't need to use this approach. My teaching's fine. I've got a waiting list and my students all perform well and pass their exams with flying colors. What's the point? If you have a studio full of dedicated, highly committed students who practice hard, enjoy the masterworks and love high level performing and you enjoy teaching them, then perhaps this isn't something you need to worry about. Lucky you. You're probably in the two to five percent maybe of teachers in the world in this space. For the rest of us who teach students who don't always want to practice too much, who don't always show up prepared, who forget their books, who are picky about their music, who teach themselves songs online, who have busy social and or sporting lives and who play video games and use their phones too much, who don't like traditional performances and for whom music is just a part of their leisure time activity, then this approach is for you. By having a student-first teaching philosophy and teaching in a more integrated way, you'll help your students make stronger connections with music and keep them learning longer and hopefully playing or singing well into adulthood. The ultimate goal is that your students will eventually make these connections themselves and in so doing will become more curious musicians. But as you get started, you'll need to find and model these connections by analysing the music, finding those elements and then planning activities you can explore to integrate them, asking lots of exploratory questions along the way. I hope that the integrated music teaching approach has struck a chord with you, pun intended, And hopefully you're keen to explore it in your own teaching, particularly if this is a new way for you to teach. I can't wait to share more about this approach in our next episode. Hey, Tim, this is Jeff Davison. Congratulations on your 300th episode of the TopCast. Uh, This continues to be one of my most listened to programs, and I am always inspired um, by each episode. Uh, on a personal note, it was a thrill for me to uh, have been interviewed by you and featured around your 200th episode a couple of years ago. And um, I have to say, you and uh, Top Music were uh, instrumental in uh, helping me to learn how to be able to teach piano lessons online and to help me navigate through the pandemic. Um, your work and um, Top Music continues to be um, really important to me as far as in, uh, providing inspiration and ideas and uh, support in uh, helping me to keep my piano teaching fresh and new and interesting, um, even after 40 years of teaching. So thank you again and congratulations. And as you say, cheers. Hi, my name's Giselle. I've been teaching now for about 22 years. I was classically trained and really I had no idea how to teach properly and in a holistic way until I saw a video of Tim probably about five years ago and it changed my life. Suddenly I understood all about chords, how to be um, an improviser, um, doing things like blues, um, basically making me a very versatile teacher, very creative, off the cuff if I may say. I'm not very good at planning. 
but it's revolutionized my teaching and whereas before it was more a hobby for me now it's my business i made myself a website recently i had it professionally improved and i just can't keep up with uh, my students i have so many i have a waiting list i even my days are filled with adults and special needs and i love it and really it's all thanks to Tim and Top Music Pro. So I really, really would recommend that you join this team and you will get so much out of it. So good luck to everyone and I hope you're all enjoying using this website. Now, before we wrap up today, I also wanted to share some feedback I received from teachers after releasing an integrated music teaching lesson video a few weeks back. Here's what just a few of them had to say. This was great. I love how Tim leads the student to the more pleasing chord progression without actually telling him what to play. Interesting to see how he pulls the creativity out through working on a published piece. This is not something I thought of before, but I will definitely do in the future as it is a great jumping off point for talking about theory. That was Sherry. And Julie said, It was interesting to see how Tim asked lots of questions, but ultimately let Finn, my student, make the final decision. I thought it was also great how Tim asked theory questions that applied directly to what Finn was playing or experimenting with. Dawn summed up lots of people's thoughts by saying, I've been teaching piano for a squillion years and students have changed so much. Tim's approach has been invaluable. And Eric, who said, I got how you highlighted certain melodic patterns in the piece incantation to your student and how you got your student to try out different chords to help him know what chords are suitable for the piece. I would like to highlight melody patterns to my students in my future lessons where possible. And this from Juliet, biggest takeaway, how much theory can be covered in an improvisational activity. I would like to explore this idea of changing a piece being worked on to make it the student's own. And the last one from Erin who said, biggest takeaway is don't be afraid to play. I love how the lesson didn't focus on technique or the intention of the composer, but used the piece as a jumping off point for the student's own exploration. From there, it requires a few bits of theory work, which always makes more sense working in context. Now, if you want to learn more about this approach, how it looks in lessons, etc., then stay tuned next week in episode number 301. I'm going to be telling you about the integrated music teaching three-step process. And we're going to play some lesson excerpts of IMT in action from my own teaching so that you can get a feeling for how it works in real lessons, just like the teachers that you've just heard from. In two weeks' time, you're also going to find out about a project we've been secretly working on for the last year, and that's the launch of our own top music certification program. I can't wait to share this with you. This is going to be in podcast 302. It's coming up really soon. During that show, you'll get a chance to join our beta testing team as the first round of teachers through our pilot certification program. I literally can't wait to share this. It's going to be so epic. So, stay tuned for that one. And last point, if you really want to immerse yourself in this approach and have me guide you along the path to trying this yourself and working out what it's all about and whether it's going to suit you, I'm going to be running a free three-day Integrate Your Teaching Challenge in November. This is going to be on November, Tuesday the 8th, 9th and 10th at 5 p.m. Eastern Time uh, America or about 30 minutes on a live Zoom. And if you've joined one of our challenges before, you'll know these are super valuable. We pack them with information and action steps without overwhelming you. Each day, we'll unpack one of the three steps in the IMT process and then give you a homework task to do that evening to try it out. We'll set up a pop-up Facebook group to share your homework, ask questions and enjoy that cohort group experience, which is so important for adult learning. I'm also going to be sharing videos from other teachers on all sorts of instruments about how they use this approach in their teaching. So, we're going to hear from the likes of Mike Grande, Jenna Williamson, Nicola Canton, Ingrid Martin and a number of others. If you can't make the live sessions, we're going to share the recordings in the group so you can watch any time, but you'll need to make sure you are registered to get all the links. So, you can sign up right now over at topmusic.co slash challenge. Hi, I hate to admit it, but I waited six years to join Tim's membership. I had been following him for a while and I enjoyed the podcasts that he had done, but I didn't think I could afford it. And I thought with going to school and being a struggling music teacher, 
that it wasn't in, it wasn't feasible. So I made the leap this summer because I moved to a new place and was trying to find new students. And oh my goodness, it has been phenomenal. I gained 10 students right away. I teach guitar now, and I wasn't doing that before. I left my job previously, and I've had so much success, and I'm making so much more than I was at that job. This is just a great wealth of information that everyone should take advantage of. I am so um, grateful that I made that leap, and I look forward to all the other information and value I will get out of this membership. How do you keep up to date with all the latest trends and research into music education? How do you connect with other teachers around the world and make sure your teaching stays fresh and relevant for students of all ages and stages both now and into the future? I created our Top Music Pro membership to be the one-stop shop for music teaching resources, training, support and community and I'd love for you to come and join us inside. With over 40 comprehensive training courses, hundreds of teaching demonstrations and lesson plans, free monthly sheet music, discounts and all the business and pedagogy support you could ever need, Top Music Pro is the community you've been looking for. If you're ready to level up your learning from the podcast and join thousands of other teachers in our global network, head over to topmusicpro.com today. If you enjoy this show and want to hear more of our work, be sure to subscribe to this podcast wherever you're listening today. For links and resources mentioned in this episode, visit us at topmusic.co slash podcast or check out the show notes. I'm Tim Topham and this is the Integrated Music Teaching Podcast, a production of Top Music. Thank you so much for listening. Enjoy your week ahead and I'll catch you next time.